Building codes have a lot to say about stairs because stairs are a safety issue. Uneven stairs cause serious falls, right? And so there's plenty of details in the code that have to be understood and complied with before you build a set of stairs or the railing. In many cases, there are more details associated with guardrails and handrails than with the stairs themselves. In this case, our first decision was, do we put the railing on the inside of the winders or on the outside of the winders? Well, there were a couple things that made that pretty obvious, even though either one would have been legal. First, if we would have come up on the outside of the winders, the railing would have intersected that window. That's weird. We didn't want to do that. Second, winders are dangerous because the tread length is different than what you're used to coming up the stairs. And it's different depending on where your um, path of travel is. So when the railing is put against the inside wall, so you have a hold of it as you go up and down the winders, the railing itself makes your path of travel consistent, right? And so you're supported, you're safe, and there's going to be a lot fewer wrecks on this stairway because we're putting the railing against the side of the railing that winds. So I went a little crazy on backing because when I was framing it, I hadn't made the decision on whether the, the, back, the railing was going to go on the right or the left. And then when I was doing the pickup in framing, I had decided it was going on this side, so I put in some more pieces. And then when the time came to actually build the templates and understand exactly where the railing was going to attach and, as it turns out, make the wooden portion of the railing, I put in a couple more pieces and these jigs document exactly where the standoffs, the standards, the attachment points are going to occur. That's one of the good things that these templates are going to do for me now. I know exactly where to put the attachments that I made in the shop in order to attach the railing that I made here and at Ken's place so I don't have to tear up this drywall in the paint trying to find exactly the right spot for what has to happen next. Now, speaking of what has to happen next, I spent a long time worrying about how to kilter a railing. Now, kiltering a stair railing means to follow the pitch of the stair. You know, a stair rail kilters to level when it comes to a landing, and it kilters when it goes around a landing and the treads get longer. Well, the, the playing with the angle, the kiltering coming around winders is profound. Number one, I had to come out of the alignment here to get around this column. And then once the stair gets to this point, the angle gets so steep. So coming up the straight flight and going up the straight flight here is exactly the same pitch. But coming across the end of this column, it's about twice as steep as on those other two pitches. So as I lay awake in bed at night wondering how to make that corner, here's an example of the really, I see now, Dr. Zeus solution that I came up with. I was hung up on the idea that I didn't want multiple pieces coming around the end of this column. I wanted one piece from the end of the railing segment on this side to the beginning of the railing segment on this side. So I thought, surely there's a way to be code compliant, the right distance off the wall, the right slope, the right size material, and make those miters happen in one spot. Well, there kind of is. But look at the bizarre shape that it requires to transition from the top one, flushing on the outside, flushing on the bottom, transitioning over to where this funny tapered shape flushes. It's just, I go from a squashed parallelogram here to a squashed piece that essentially has six sides over here. And the takeaway is none of this shape is code compliant. It's the wrong size and it would never pass code even, even if it didn't look silly. So here's where we're at. This railing segment is code compliant. It's the right distance off the wall. It's the right distance off the stair. It comes past the head of the stair the right distance and it will return and make contact with the sheetrock when I install it. I'll have the right number of supports. And it terminates down here with a little horizontal piece that will then turn 90 degrees on a little horizontal piece before it dives down that steep pitch to intersect the same thing down on the other corner. I was in a Victorian old, nice old house some time ago, and they had a situation like this where they came down and then went horizontally to the middle of the column 
dropped down vertically, and then traveled over to intercept. But Nate and I talked it over and decided we didn't want a fire pole feeling here at the bottom of these winders for kids to grab and swing around and fly off and go through the tempered glass window. It just didn't add up. And I would just like to shout out to Steve Ellis, a friend of mine in Texas who is a guy who has taken construction math to its zenith as a carpenter. And he and I had extended phone calls and scratched our heads and finally decided that this was probably the best solution. One of the first things he told me was, ask Ken, because he had watched the video about Ken Jordan's place. And I did, and we had a good time, and now we're ready to put this thing up. Bango bongo. We just can't go wrong. Cool. The mark is good. The big mark is even better. Architectural ironwork, as it's known, is almost its own specialty in modern blacksmithing. Now iron is strong and structural and versatile, but it's also beautiful when it includes elements of hand forging, and I often think it is best thought of as sort of house jewelry. Jewelry for your house. A tasteful ornament that also has a job to do. As I wrestled with the design on these brackets, I was always thinking first of function. They had to pass inspection and be strong. Then form. They had to work with the overall aesthetic of the house and with the other hardware on the doors and the sinks and the lighting. And finally, I had to consider buildability. I had to be able to actually make these things with the tools and know-how that I've got at my disposal. The design process for me is by far the most difficult part of a project like this. As it turned out, I drew some inspiration from Ken's place and from the plumbing fixtures we've picked out. I built a couple of drifts and dies and jigs for the fly press and went to work. Man, I love to forge iron. This railing came from an Oregon white oak tree that I cut down on my friend Bill Martineau's place a few years ago. White oak is good stuff. It's hard, it's strong, it's stable, and it works and sands and stains up really, really nice. I am a big fan of jigs and templates. So I used some scraps and leftovers from a couple other projects to throw together these railing templates. It was the only way that I could figure out to be absolutely certain that I could quarter. duplicate and put in place, after the drywall and paint was done, what I had committed myself to weeks earlier. Now, it doesn't always pay to spend the time to build a jig, but when it does, don't hold back. Make it bulletproof. I see that this footage is pretty hard to follow because the work that I did happened at the house and at my shop and at Ken Jordan's shop and it was spread out over a couple of months here a little and there a little so I really hope that the sequence of events makes some sense I remember as I watched this 
that I was really excited to finally get a look at how the whole thing was going to come together. So I've spent a ridiculous amount of time on this little project, but it's all right because it's coming together. But when I put these two pieces of railing on that I had prefabricated, they almost worked perfectly, but not quite. I had to remove this one to make it a little longer, and I had to remove this little corner to bring it down to where it was level. So with those in place, I'm ready to sort of mock up how this kilter is gonna work figure out the angle to bisect the angles and uh, see if I can pull a rabbit out of the hat on this. As I watch this footage, I am struck at what an advantage modern glues and power tools and especially cordless drills and impact drivers have given us over our fathers and grandfathers who spent their lives doing these sorts of jobs. Now, to be honest, I can imagine doing the iron work without electricity, sort of, but I have no idea how I would have built this wooden hand railing without these epoxies and drills. This railing is just one more example of the complicated construction puzzles that were lurking in the 38 degree bend between the house and the garage. I talked a lot about this in a couple of the roof building videos and the same process that got me through the roof got me through the stairs and railing. That process I think can be boiled down to just a few steps. First, remove all the distractions. Second, lose a little sleep thinking about it off the job. You know, before you fall asleep and before you get out of bed, solve some of the puzzles before you're on site. Next, take baby steps. You gotta go slow. You can't jump into something that's going to limit your options in the future. Maybe, maybe one of the really big ones is get good advice from the people you know that really know. And then last, be confident because all the problems that you've solved in the past have qualified you to solve the problem you're facing right now. There have been plenty of days over the years that I've thought that maybe I should have named my business Starfish Construction. Not sure where I am. Not really sure where I'm headed, but I'm still moving. And that may be the most important thing. Just keep moving. I'm on the home stretch. I've got two miters left to, to uh, put together permanently. Out of 13, being down to the last two feels great. So let me show you how I've been doing this. I put a screw in here to hold it temporarily. I'll take this one out. Here's the piece. It's a five minute epoxy. I'm gonna put it on both sides of the miter. It's gonna take a little longer than that because it's cold in here this morning. I'm gonna try not to put it on the screw.
Okay, once it's in place, I'm gonna clean everything up. I'm sure that all the surfaces are planing the way I want. I'm gonna clean up that epoxy with acetone. Epoxy that's left in place is hard to sand off. So you get it nice and clean. Acetone does not stain the wood. So now we wait probably five, maybe, maybe eight or ten minutes until that's nice and hard and we'll do the same thing to the other end. So that's it. I'm gonna do this to one more joint. Once the glue's hard, I'll cut off the dowels and sand everything to where it feels just the way it's supposed to feel. But that doesn't mean it's done. Because when the floor man is putting the oak floor through the downstairs, we're gonna make sure that this is sanded and colored so that it matches, so that the whole project is cohesive from the front to the back and the top to the bottom. And it is those final details that so often make the difference between a job being done and a job being finished. Thank you for watching Essential Craftsman, and keep up the good work. Mm -hmm.